Welcome to the Sunset Streaming Studies once again. You've, you've joined in our current series the, uh, that we've called Draw Near, Grasping God's Gift of Prayer. And it's been our prayer that through these studies, we've helped you to develop a more fruitful and a more faithful lifestyle of prayer. You can access these lessons from this series and, and all of our lessons on our website at sunsetchurchofchrist.com. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can follow us on Facebook. Our, our objective is to teach the Bible with clarity so that all persons may be complete in Christ. With that in mind, we've looked at several components as they pertain to prayer. We've looked at the purpose of prayer and its power. We've recognized the privilege we have to pray, principles that we use in our prayer life, the persistence that is necessary, the positions of prayer, looking at uh, different positions that people have assumed in the Bible, uh, and really the position of our heart, which is paramount to, to our prayers. We looked at the practice of prayer, looked at several practical ways where we can implement a more consistent prayer life. In this lesson, I want for us to consider the place of prayer, the place where we pray. And perhaps this may be a little redundant from previous lessons, but I wanted to focus on two particular passages from the book of Hebrews that speak one of our privilege to pray, but also that speak of the place where prayer takes place. Many people will designate a specific place uh, and, and even a specific time, as we, as we have seen in, in the practice of prayer, where they will, where they will uh, go to pray, to be alone, uh, to be with their father. Sometimes we see this, we see children learning to kneel beside their bed, and perhaps you still do that. We see people who bow at the dinner table before their meals to pray together, uh, oftentimes as a family, and, and praying to the Lord. I'm, I'm reminded of the story of Susanna Wesley. She's the mother of John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Of course, John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist denomination. Charles Wesley is the author of over 9,000 hymns, many of which we still sing today. But Susanna Wesley was married to a preacher. His name was Samuel. And their, their marriage was difficult. Uh, they argued a lot. They would fight about anything. And so, uh, so it was a very difficult situation in their home. And, and oftentimes, Samuel would leave their mother, or would, would leave John and Charles' mother, would leave Susanna to raise their children. They had, they had 19 children only 10 of which survived infancy. And so with these 10 children, Susanna was left to raise them on her own much of the time. Susanna was, uh, was known as a, as a fairly sickly woman uh, and yet would raise the children on her own. She would, uh, she would oftentimes be milking the cows. She would be working in the fields and in the gardens. She would be preparing the meals. She would teach her children at home. And, and so it was a very busy life. And, and oftentimes it would be difficult to find time, let alone space or a place to pray. And so one of the things that she would do is tell her children that whenever you saw her apron over her head, that she was in prayer, that she was not to be disturbed. And so uh, so you have this picture of a mom who is who is sitting in her chair and and pulls her apron up over her head so that she has a place to pray. Her children all knew that that was her time, that was her place, and that she was not to be disturbed. But we need to remember that the physical location is not as important as the place where prayer is actually offered. Let's take a look at some of the examples. We're going to spend some time in Hebrews chapter 10 and in Hebrews chapter 4. 
And and before we get to those to to those two passages, I, I want us to see people in the Bible who had their places to pray, a physical location. You may remember Daniel would pray in his house. He would he would go to his roof chamber and he would pray privately. He was ordered not to pray, and this was all a setup for Daniel in that when when he was caught praying that his the people that were jealous of him would turn him in and that he would be executed. He would be thrown into the lion's den and presumably the lions would would take care of him. And so he would he would go into his own house and the text tells us Daniel 6 and verse 10 that he would go into the chamber on his roof. There was a window there that was open toward Jerusalem and he would pray. We're told that David would pray in a cave often time, uh, most, most often in the cave of Adullam. And he would, he would go into, the, into this cave and he was hiding from his enemies and he would pray for the Lord's deliverance from Saul, the king, and from his other enemies. And so Psalm 57 and verse 1, Psalm 142 verse 1, described David praying from a cave. Nehemiah, he would pray in the presence of the king. Nehemiah, one of the reasons I love Nehemiah is he prayed everywhere, but he would pray in the presence of the king. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 4, David, or, uh, Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the king, and he goes into the king's presence, and the king sees that he is sad. It's, um, uh, it, 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 it's a sadness of heart as, as he describes it. And so he asks him, what is the trouble? And before Nehemiah answers King Artaxerxes, Nehemiah prays to the Lord right there in front of him. Just a quick, seemingly quick, uh, brief prayer to to ask the Lord for strength. Of course, we see uh, Moses who would go on the mountain to pray. And then we would see Jesus as well go to the mountain to pray. And oftentimes Jesus would draw, uh, would, would, um, would draw away from the people and would go to the mountains where he could be by himself to pray, where he is unencumbered by the distractions of the crowds and the people milling around and, and everybody clamoring for his attention. Elijah, we would see who, who would pray for the widow's son, would pray in the upper room of the widow's home where he would take the son and carry him up to his own room, lay him on his bed, and then he would lay across him three times asking the Lord uh, to restore the life of this widow's son. We see Elijah as well praying uh, as he would come near to the altar where he had built uh, the altar to challenge the uh, the priests of Baal. And uh, as they built their altar and nobody responded to their cries to accept their sacrifice, when Elijah came, built his offer, altar to the Lord and covered it, doused it with water. And then he came near, it says, and he prayed to the Lord. And so the Lord come, came down and and he uh, consumed that sacrifice. And then, of course, you can read about the rest of uh, the details and what happens to the prophets of Baal. But when we look at all of these examples, we come to realize that there are times when having our own place and even our own time is beneficial to be alone with our Father, where it's just you and Him where you can focus, where you can be free from other distractions. Maybe you go in a room, you turn the lights off, you're all by yourself, and you can just talk with your Father, just as Jesus taught us to. And so it's, it's important sometimes to have that physical location, a place where we pray. We see people in their places. We see priests in the tabernacle. We see priests who enter into the tabernacle carrying incense, which uh, represent the prayers of the people. And they will take those uh, uh, into the tabernacle 
and will offer up those prayers in the incense uh, on behalf of the people. They also enter the tabernacle with blood. The high priest every year on the Day of Atonement would take blood from the bull from the, from the altar of burnt offering and he would enter into the tabernacle and he would pass through the holy place entering beyond the veil, inside the veil, into the most holy place, the presence of God, the, the, the throne room, if you will, the place of God's mercy seat, uh, where God's presence is known. And he would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat to make atonement for himself and for all of the people. And so we see him taking the blood of these animals to make atonement. We see him taking incense uh, to offer prayers on behalf of the people. That's why the Hebrew writer emphasizes the superiority of the priesthood of Christ. It, it, when you look at the book of Hebrews, really from chapter 5 verse 1 through about chapter 10 and verse 18, the emphasis is on the supremacy of Christ's priesthood over that of the old Levitical system. And so we see that Christ serves as our high priest of course, he will need to enter into a tabernacle, but it's described as a tabernacle not made with hands. It's, it's the tabernacle as he passes through the heavens. And so as we look at people who have their places of prayer, as we look at priests who serve in the tabernacle to offer up the prayers in the incense on behalf of the people, we recognize that, that the people could not enter that holy place themselves. They had to have a priest who would enter into that holy place to offer their prayers. That's where we see the privilege that we have to draw near to God. And that's where we find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 10. And, and in verse 19, the Hebrew writer says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And so as we, as we look at the prayer that takes place within the veil, really the place of prayer recognizes access to the holy place. And the Hebrew writer says, since we have confidence to enter that holy place, there's a confidence that says we can enter in there. The, the Jew, the Hebrew under the old covenant would never have confidence. In fact, they would be very fearful. This all, this all stems from the, the incident that happened with Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, who entered the most holy place. They entered it with strange fire before the Lord. And, and as we know, they dropped down dead, Leviticus chapter 10. And, and they died there before the Lord. Their bodies had to be drug out from the Lord's presence. And, and from then on, people would, would be fearful of entering into the, to the presence of the Lord. Even the high priest on the Day of Atonement, it, it, he, would, he would not linger in there for fear that he would do something wrong and, and um, that he would be there too long or, or inappropriately. And, and so they, they would go in and they would go out quickly. They would they'd just do what they have to do and get out of there because people were fearful of that. There, were, there was no confidence any longer to enter into the presence of the Lord. And, and so the Hebrew writer is, is trying to reassure these former Jews who have become Christians, they have believed on the Lord, they've obeyed the gospel, they've become Christians, their bodies have been washed with pure water, their conscience have, has been cleansed. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 says corresponding to that, referring to uh, Noah and how his family was saved through water, 
Corresponding to that, he says baptism now saves you also. It's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but it's an appeal to God for a good conscience, having our conscience cleaned. And in fact, in, in chapter in Hebrews chapter 9, he says uh, in verse 13, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so that appeal to God for a good conscience is something that they that these Hebrew people have already done. And so the writer here is trying to explain to them that they have confidence to enter the holy place, to enter into the throne room of God. We have confidence. Well, how? It's because there's a new and living way, he says. It is a life-giving way. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 uses the same word when he says the word of God is living and active. The idea of of the word of God being living is the idea of being life-giving. And so we have a life-giving way, and it is new. It is something that was unknown before. It's not something that um, that was previously in existence and has now just been made new. This is this is totally new, and so it is a life-giving way. The old way was not life-giving. The new way was life-giving. It was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, it could not offer life. And so this new way is a life-giving way. If you look at chapter 6 and in verse 19, he says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. That's a hope that is confident. It is sure. It is steadfast. It enters within the veil. Listen to verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so we go inside the veil because Jesus has gone in before us. In chapter 10 and in verse 11, we're told that every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. And so all of the priests would stand daily and they would minister Uh, And they would offer over and over and over and over again the blood of animals that could never take away sin. But Jesus made a once-for-all sacrifice. And it says, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so the priests were standing, which indicates that their ministry was ongoing, never ending. When Jesus sat down, that means that his ministry was finished. That once for all sacrifice for sins was accomplished. And he sat down. It's interesting to note that that atonement and and the work of Jesus was was not completed at the cross. He had to enter into heaven and sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. He had to enter into that holy place as a forerunner for us to really complete that atonement and to present that sacrifice and that offering. And so we see how important the resurrection for Jesus is. And then from Acts chapter 1 to see how important his ascension back to the Father in heaven really is that he might sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. And it says that this new and living way was inaugurated for us through the veil, which is his flesh. In other words, his flesh opens up the way through the veil 
for us to have access to the Father. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18 tells us that he is our peace and, and that he has given us access in one spirit to the Father. Nobody else gives us access to God. That is the unique uh, the unique claim of the Christian faith is that Christ is the only means of access to God. And so he has granted us that access. That is the place of our prayer. That is the holy place. And so he says, since we have confidence, and then he says, since we have a great high priest over the house of God in verse 21, you'll notice that twice he says since. And so he's developing an argument that says, since we have this, since we have confidence, since we have a great high priest, then he says, let us. These are the, um, these are the instructions, if you will. Then let us, and he says, let us um, draw near, let us hold fast, and let us consider how to stimulate one another toward love and good deeds. And so since we have this and since we have that, let us do this and let us do that. You'll find that argument four times in the book of Hebrews. It's, it's an interesting observation. In chapter 4 and verse 14, chapter 10, verse 22, right here that we're looking at, chapter 12 and verse 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that entangles and run with endurance. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28, the argument of since then and let us is an important concept in the book of Hebrews. And so he says here in chapter 22, let us draw near. Since we have confidence, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, and, and if you look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6, that house, he says, he says in verse 5, Moses was faithful in all of his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm till the end. You see, we have confidence and we have to hold fast to that confidence because Christ is faithful as a son over his house. You see, Christ is superior to the ministry of Moses, a servant in the house. Christ is a son over the house, whose house we are. So we have a great high priest over the house of God, over his church. And so because of that, we draw near to the throne of grace, as he says in chapter 4. And in verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, the imagery there of the high priest who would pass through the holy place into the most holy place. He's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. You see there, since then we have a great high priest. Then let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. You see, this is what made one of the things that made his high priesthood great. In fact, you'll see where Jesus is referred to as the great high priest in verse 14. That, that description was never applied to the old covenant priests of the Levitical priesthood. There were high priests, but none of them, not even Aaron, was considered a great high priest. Jesus is a great high priest because he's been tempted in all things as we are, in all ways as we are, yet he was without sin. That makes his priesthood great. And so he says, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so we draw near to that throne of grace. Chapter 7, verse 23, the former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. You see, when the priest died, then that priesthood would be passed on to the next generation. And so the priest could no longer serve because he died. And so he was prevented from continuing because of death. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, 
This speaks of, of Jesus' eternal existence, that Jesus is, is living. Because he continues forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. He will always serve as our priest, as our great high priest. And it says, therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, Jesus lives. The old priesthood, they all died. Jesus lives, and he lives to make intercession for us. He's able to save those who draw near to God through him. In chapter 9 and in verse 24, or verse 23, Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifices by the sacrifice of himself. And so in that sacrifice, Jesus has atoned for our sin. He has entered into that holy place. He has entered into heaven itself for us. He lives to make intercession for us. He gives us a way. He provides for us entrance or access to God's throne room. The place of prayer recognizes access to that holy place. If we don't understand the old covenant system and, and the tabernacle and, and the temple and the priesthood and the sacrifices, then we can never fully appreciate what Jesus has accomplished for us in entering into heaven. That's our access to the holy place. But the place of prayer is also where the Christian finds strength. Turn with me to chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, as we just read, we have a great high priest. This is the sense. We have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us, here's a let us, hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us, here's the other let us, since we have a great high priest, let us hold fast our confession and let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, it's because we have this great high priest that, that, we, can, um, that we can hold fast that confidence and that we can draw near to the throne of grace. We're told that it is at that throne where we receive mercy. We have this high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted. It, it, you can read Matthew chapter 4 and you can look at, at three specific instances of Jesus' temptations when he's in the wilderness being tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. We're told that it was the Spirit who led him out there to be tempted by the devil. And so in each instance, Jesus overcame the temptation by recalling scripture, by simply stating what God had said. It is written. The, the devil said, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus says, it is written, you will not live by bread alone. The devil tells him to, to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And, and Jesus says, you should not tempt the Lord your God. The, the devil tells him to bow down and worship me, join me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms. And Jesus says, it is written, you shall serve the Lord and him only. And so he recalls scripture every time that he's tempted. And so he knows what it means to be tempted. He knows how to face that temptation. And he knows how to overcome it because he was without sin when he faced temptation. 
And so he can sympathize with our weaknesses, we're told. And so we can find that mercy and and we can receive that forgiveness when we succumb to those temptations. First John chapter 1 and verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. You see, this idea of, of drawing near to God to receive mercy, that's, that's not the initial plea for forgiveness and for salvation. The, these Christians to whom the Hebrew writer is writing, they've already obeyed the gospel. These, these people are already Christians. In 1 John, he's already addressing people who are, who are Christians, people who've already obeyed the gospel. They are walking in the light. And, and John says in verse 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That's that continual cleansing as people are walking in the light. These people are walking in the light. And so as they succumb to temptation during that time, then they can come and draw near to the throne of grace to receive mercy, to receive that sympathetic ear, one who can understand our struggles, our weaknesses, but one who can forgive when we fall to temptation. That's not an excuse to keep on going. Paul would say in Romans 6, 1, should we go on sinning that grace may abound? Absolutely not, he says. God forbid, he says, in your, maybe in your translation. And so that's not an excuse to keep on sinning. We're to, we're to continually fight those temptations, fight against those urges. But we know that when we fall, we can go and confess our sins to him. And we know that we can find that mercy. We can receive that mercy. And we can find grace to help in time of need. Paul would, would plead with the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, as, as he has this thorn in the flesh to prevent him from talking about visions that he's seen. And so Paul says, there was given me this thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to prevent me from talking about these visions. And, and he says that he pleaded with the Lord three times that he would remove that, that thorn from my side. And every time the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. So oftentimes we, we wonder, well, what is grace? If we've got this thorn in the flesh, we've got this struggle, this difficulty, whatever that is, and people have offered many speculative answers on what that thorn is. But nonetheless, we know that it was to prevent him from going on. It was to prevent him from bragging, from boasting about these visions. And so Paul then became content with his weaknesses because power is made strong in weakness. And Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. It's that grace. It, it, it's the favor we find with God. It's strength that God provides. It's the counsel that God gives us in dealing with the temptation and, and with whatever thorn we might think we have. It's God giving us direction in life. And so certainly in Paul's life and in his ministry, when God's grace was sufficient, it was God's grace. It was the strength that God provided when Paul didn't have the strength of his own to continue on in his ministry. And, and if, you, if you continue reading in 2 Corinthians uh, after, after verse 9, you'll see in the next few verses, Paul is going to talk about the difficulties that he has, infirmities and persecutions and things like that. And it was the grace of Christ that enabled him to continue his work, to continue his mission. And it is God's grace. It is the grace of Christ that enables us to continue our walk in the light and our walk with him in fellowship with God. That's where we find grace to help 
in time of need. In our prayers, we're reaffirming our dependence upon God's grace and our trust in that grace to see us through. That's why the place of prayer is so important that we draw near to the throne of grace, that we enter into, enter inside the veil, into the holy place, into the presence of God himself. The place of prayer is where the Christian finds access to our Father. The, pr- the place of prayer is where the Christian finds strength to face all the duties and all the trials of life, to walk in the light as he himself is in the light. People have had their places, specific physical locations, on on the roof chamber of a house, in a cave, in the presence of a king. Maybe it's on a mountain. Maybe it's kneeling beside your bed or, or bowing at your dinner table. Maybe it's just like Susanna Wesley who would find a place in her, ho- in her house and throw her apron over her head. People have had a place to pray and oftentimes that's important for us to have that place. Jesus thought it was where we could go and be by ourselves and just be alone with our Father. To be free from distraction where we can just focus on our relationship with the Father to draw near to seek the things that are needed for a life that is faithful. That's the place of prayer, access to our Father, and strength from our Father. The physical location does not lead to the efficacy of our prayers, but we pray because we have throne room standing. We pray because we have access to the Father, that throne room standing that says, I can come in here. I can be confident to enter into a place where these Hebrew people would never dream of going. They're fearful of going because if they enter in there, they they saw what happened to Nadab and Abihu, and they died. And so that presence of the Lord was a very fearful place. And the Hebrew writer says, we have confidence to enter the throne room of God. You now have throne room standing because of the work of Christ, because he was the forerunner who entered into God's presence before us and for us. So we pray because we have access. We have throne room standing. We pray because we have a great high priest over the house of God. We have a priest, a high priest, a great high priest, who lives to make intercession for us, who, whose purpose is to intercede on our behalf, to plead our case with our Father because he's our high priest. We can pray. We pray because we have confidence. I pray that this series has been so helpful to you. I pray that it's opened your eyes to the whole practice of prayer, that it becomes more than just a ritual, more than just liturgy, but that it becomes a meaningful avenue where where you can talk with your Father who is in heaven, where you can go confidently, where people of the old covenant would never dream of going, to see the privilege that we have in prayer, to recognize the purpose and the power of prayer, to apply principles that make prayer more meaningful. And so it is my prayer that this whole series has helped to develop within you a more fruitful and a more faithful lifestyle of prayer. May God bless you.